When I was growing up, I looked for heroes, and no other story inspired me and captured my imagination more than that of Private Desmond T. Doss, the first conscientious objector to ever receive the Medal of Honor. The more I tried to comprehend his amazing actions, the larger than life he became. I never thought that 25 years later as a filmmaker, I'd find myself atop historic Lookout Mountain, just outside of Chattanooga, Tennessee, in a little place called Rising Fawn, Georgia. I was here to meet the man who had been my boyhood hero. What I found was a simple man living a simple life, who could only hear me through the aid of his cochlear implant and though at times his words were hard to understand, the character of the man spoke loud and clear. Okay. I hear you. Okay, I'm hearing you now. Okay. Born in Lynchburg, Virginia on February 7th, 1919 to Tom and Bertha Doss, Desmond grew up as the middle child in a typical Depression-era family. Filled with curiosity, little Desmond found fascination with simple things. My mother had a um, picture on, in the living room, a real large picture, of the uh, Ten Commandments. He, he was too small to get up. He wanted to touch it. He would get up in a chair, and he was reading them, and he couldn't understand why did Cain kill Abel. The Bible says, thou shalt not kill. He pointed, always pointed to it. He's, he was just that type of boy. Cain had this big club that he killed his brother with. I wonder how in the world could a brother do such a thing? To me, it was said, Desmond, if you love me, you won't kill. And it was so horrible, but I just had to keep looking at that thing. And as a result, I didn't want to ever take life. These simple images would stay with Desmond for the rest of his life and help define his character. On a typical day, Desmond could be found playing under the train trestle or flattening pennies on the railroad tracks that ran behind his backyard. His best friend was his brother, Harold. I went to give him a hip toss, and the grass was wet, and I slipped, and I landed right on his head. And I, it, it hurt my hip, as a matter of fact. And I turned to him, I said, now do you give up? And all he says, uh-uh. He couldn't even speak. <laughs> he just said, uh-uh. And I said, that's it. That was the last time we ever wrestled because he was not one that would give up. He didn't know how. The Great Depression took its toll on Desmond's father. He was often drunk and despondent. Fortunately, it was his mother's love and compassionate ways that had the greatest impact on Desmond's life. She let us be ourselves. She was very spiritual, and she brought us all up being spiritual. Bertha Dawes took her children to a small Seventh-day Adventist church, a church that believed in keeping all of the Ten Commandments. She lived her life by these principles, and young Desmond followed her example. He was always helpful to people. Anyone sick, he had to be there. 
It was announced on the radio. We didn't have TVs in that day. It was announced that it was an accident on uh, Route 29, and they need some blood right away to save this woman's life. We, he walked three miles to that hospital and walked three more miles back home after he had blood. Two days later, a call came back over the radio. They need more blood. There he goes again. Walks us three miles, then walks three miles back. A defining moment came to young Desmond one hot summer evening near his home in Lynchburg, Virginia. This is an experience I'll never forget. What happened, my uncle and my dad were both drinking. In fact, I'm afraid more than them were drunk. And they got into a fight. Insults were thrown and challenges made until in the heat of the moment, Desmond's father pulled out a gun. They were fighting and they, they had their gun and mother got in between. Neither one of them wanted to hit mother. And so, Mother told us, you give me that gun. So the police are on the way, and you're going to be in real trouble. They catch you with that gun. They took the bullets out and gave her the gun. Mother gave me that gun. She said, go hide that gun. I ran home. It was about a block or two away. With the 45 pistol hidden in a safe place, Desmond ran back just in time to see the police arresting his father. Then the I showed my dad in back of that old black wagon with the drunks, and then they drove off. And I'll never forget that experience because if it hadn't been for mother, my daddy would most likely have killed him. Though Desmond can smile about it now, the incident of his father almost killing his own brother-in-law brought the Cain and Abel story too close to home, and he vowed that that would be the last time he ever touched a gun. Congress declare that since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7, 1941, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. We will gain the inevitable triumph, so help us God. At the time, Desmond worked at the Newport News Naval Shipyard, which made him eligible for a deferment. But when his boss offered him one, he wouldn't hear of it. Instead, when Uncle Sam called, he was ready. I felt like it was an honor to serve God and country. We were fighting for our religious liberty and freedom. He knew he was going to have difficulty because he doesn't uh, use a gun. In World War II, it was a total commitment among Americans to serve, uh, go to the draft, volunteer for the draft, to do your duty. And one gentleman said that uh, three men in his hometown committed suicide because they were not physically able to serve. Now, think about that for a moment here. Because they were physically inadequate, they were 4F or whatever the, the, the code was, they couldn't serve, so they committed suicide? I mean, so here you have a person who steps up and says, I'm a conscientious objector, I won't carry a weapon, because of my religious beliefs? Can you imagine? He was not going to use a gun. I'm going in as a medic. I'll do that. 
And when I told the sergeant I was supposed to be in the medic, <laughs> we tell you where you belong. You don't tell us nothing. And I found it any minute. The Army told Desmond that since he would not carry a gun, they would send him to a conscientious objector's camp. There, he would work with men who refused to wear the uniform or salute the flag, men who didn't believe in defending their country. This form of service seems to me to provide a more satisfactory means of settling the difficulties of today than does the war method. For this reason, I'm a conscientious objector. I tried to explain that I was not type of conscious objector. I tried to explain I was a conscious cooperator. I would say anyone is wrong to try to compromise somebody's conviction. I don't care whether it's the army or, or what it is. When you're under conviction, that is not a joke. That's what you are. I did believe in salute my conscious flag wearing my country's uniform, and serve my country the same as anyone else. At Desmond's insistence, the military decided that he could serve in the regular army, but with the classification he did not want. 1AO, conscientious objector. So Desmond headed off to South Carolina to join the 77th Division and begin his basic training at Fort Jackson. I asked Desmond to go with me, back to where it all began. I'm looking forward to getting back to the base and see some of the old bikes and things I understand they're still standing. I didn't like my classification, and I objected at the draft board. And then it was explained to me this way. It meant that I was going into the service under conditions that I would not be forced to buy arms. Here at Fort Jackson, Desmond looked forward to becoming a combat medic, but the Army had other plans. A postcard from Desmond to his fiancee, Dorothy Schutte, dated April 16, 1942. Dear Dorothy, they have taken me out of the medical attachment, so the next letter, let it be Private Doss, Company C, 307th Infantry, 77th Division, U.S. Army. Pray for me. Love, Desmond. The Army knew that peer pressure was powerful medicine, so they assigned Desmond to a rifle company the perfect scenario where a conscientious objector was least likely to be accepted. It was in these very barracks filled with future G.I. Joes that Desmond discovered that his beliefs would be severely tested. He was regarded, very frankly, as a pest. That's as true as I can say, a pest. And uh, I said, well, what do we need him for? Let him get out of the army, throw him out. You know, he's soft-spoken. Very, you know, easy going, you know. But uh, a lot of people thought this guy was putting on an act, you know. He, uh, what, what, what kind of religion? You can't do this, you can't do that, you know. His tenacious practice of the principles that he held true not only alienated Desmond from his fellow soldiers, it made him a target for their ridicule. You didn't want to associate him. You didn't want to go to latrine with him. You didn't want to eat with him. You didn't want him in your unit. You didn't want to have anything to do with him. And uh, he was immediately branded with a scarlet letter, so to speak. They don't like the idea he was always a guy with a Bible, and his, he always carried his Bible. Then he had a small one always carried in his pocket. And his, they're always seeing him reading his Bible. That just made them fierce. Some people don't believe in religion, so they figure, well, what the hell is he doing, you know? I was just something that, uh, a joke. And they made fun of me. Who he think he is? Holy Jesus. Uh, Holy Joe. You know, he'd say his prayers at night and everything. 
and and, and some guys some guys took the shoes and threw shoes at him and uh, threw things at him and made made fun of him right, right out in the open. I I don't think I could have taken what that guy did. I don't think I could have taken it. But but he hung in there. He hung in there regardless what they said or what they did. Why do you think he was able to take that? Uh, <clears throat> because. Because of his real strong beliefs, that's the only way that I could understand it. That you know, he was a hundred percent. He he was a hundred percent in his religion and his beliefs, and he just disregarded what what they said. I I don't think I could have, I don't think I could have handled it, but he did, and that's why I give him a lot of credit. One fella, he told me, I swear to God, Dallas, you go in combat, I don't shoot you. It's your buddies that get you along in life, and certainly in the military, they help you survive. Well, I don't think he really had a friend. You know, he didn't have friends. Because he was too much out of the mainstream, see? I have to, I have to give him credit for uh, having a lot of intestinal fortitude to stand up to that ridicule and to that criticism. Now, I don't blame the men for doing some of the things they did. It's just I was just someone who let the steam off on, and they probably thought I was just like, trying to get out of the service. They didn't know I, I was off of deferment. The men of the 77th Division were required to go through mountain training exercises. Part of this training included learning to tie a variety of knots. One of the basic knots that every man had to learn was the bowline, a knot with a loop that wouldn't slip. One day, while practicing the bowline knot, Desmond was surprised to find that by doubling the rope, it made two loops instead of just one. He had no way of knowing just how important that little discovery would become. The one relationship Desmond could count on was with Dorothy Schutte. Their letters had become his lifeline. And on August 17, 1942, they got married. Desmond's troubles with the Army would follow him when the 77th Division moved to Fort Pickett, Virginia. Besides his conviction not to take life, Desmond followed another principle that he learned from the picture on the wall. The Fourth Commandment told him to keep the Sabbath day holy. For Desmond, that meant not working from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. The Lord says, remember the seventh day to keep it holy. Six days shall I labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it I shall not do any work. And I took that personal to me, me. That Saturday was his day for praying and uh, not moving around, not doing anything. Jesus' religion wouldn't let him. He, he was allowed to practice his religion on Saturday without any duties. So there was a kind of a feeling that he was uh, getting th uh, a privilege that they were not getting. And I think that was the general opinion of, uh, of all the non-coms and the privates or whatever. He had to have all these privileges, see? He got off on Saturday. I didn't get off on Saturday. That, you don't do it that way. You do what you have to now. Oh, man. Everybody can't say, I don't want to go today. I'll go tomorrow. Yeah. That he would come to the dispensary for his pass. Friday evening, Major, I want my pass. Then he'd go off to some little village or town or someplace or find a little church and he'd spend his time and then he'd come back the next day. And uh, on Sunday, he was given all the rough details because they said, you were off yesterday, you get the tough details today. Desmond never complained about his tough duties and after a month of being in the infantry, he got some welcome news. 
May 5, 1942. Dear Dorothy, I am back in the medical attachment, so when you write, be sure you don't write to see, for I am not there anymore. Even though his new commanding officer was Jewish and believed in the same Sabbath as Desmond, Captain Statman found Desmond's weekly request for Saturday off a source of constant annoyance. He said, I am a Jew. We believe in keeping Saturday too. We are in the army now. You have to do the same thing. If you're Jewish and very religious, uh, you might not want to do certain things on Friday night or all day Saturday. I think uh, our religion permits us to carry out our duties, whatever they are, as necessary. Desmond held his ground and kept his Sabbath faithfully every week. But tensions continued until finally, Captain Statman had had enough. He says, Doss, I am not signing any more pass for you or like anyone else sign a pass. Or is it clear? A letter home, April 12, 1943. Dear Dorothy, I talked to Captain Statman about not being there Sabbath, and he was still red hot. He said that he would court-martial me if I gave him any more trouble, that I wasn't any better than any of the others, and that I wasn't going to have Saturdays off. He also said that I wasn't any good to him, and he was going to get rid of me the first chance he got. Desmond's conviction outweighed Captain Statman's intimidation, and even under the threat of court-martial, Desmond continued to ask for his weekly pass. In the summer of 1943, the 77th Division moved to Camp Hyder, Arizona for desert training. Those things are still there. Two of Desmond's fellow soldiers, Jim Boylan and Jack Glover, joined us at the abandoned site. Wow, wow, wow. I think that's the worst, the worst place that we ever could be sent to on the face of this earth. We, we were the first, first uh, infantry outfit, I think, to take uh, maneuvers out there. And what the hell they tried to prove, I don't know. Uh, it was miserable during the day when, the, when it was 128 in the shade and no shade. They, they thought we were go going on hikes dur during the daytime and 100 degrees plus with, with one canteen of water. So here you're out on, on the desert where the temperature is 110, you're sweating out a gallon. How could you possibly get along on one canteen of water? We lost people. People died from dehydration. Desmond wrote home concerned about the well-being of his men. July 9, 1943. This morning, I went to the company commander and told him that all the water cans were full, and the men wanted water, and the kitchen wanted the cans back by 9.30 so they could have them refilled. Did he get hot? He asked me if I was trying to tell him how to run things. He told me that he was running the company and I could take care of the blisters. And if I had any complaints, to go to the battalion commander. So I went to Captain Ben's and told him what took place. The men got their water, but Desmond took the heat from the company commander. The conditions at Camp Hyder were so bad that desertions were common. Some men ran off into the desert never to be seen again. But no matter how severe the conditions got, Desmond always put his men first, sharing his ration of water, treating their raw and blistered feet, and caring for those with dehydration or sunstroke. They found out I put my heart and my work, and I want to help all of them that I could. However, in spite of Desmond's willing service, his officers still considered him their weakest link, and they were determined to find a way to do something about it. Commander Jack Glover didn't just want Desmond out of the company. He wanted him out of the Army. I said, well, we're going into a war, and it's kill or be killed, and everyone has to have a damn gun, because 
it's, it's that type of thing, and uh, that's the only way we're going to win a war is to kill all of them so before they kill us. And uh, he said, Lieutenant, don't ever doubt my courage because I will be right by your side saving life while you take life. And I told him, you're not going to be by, by my damn side if you don't carry a gun. All the rest of the medics were armed with sidearms, 45 automatics, and I felt that he should do likewise. So I went to my battalion commander, Colonel Gerald Cooney, and I suggested that, uh, in my opinion, uh, Daw should be transferred. I don't question Glover's sincerity either at that time. I think he was very sincere in his feeling that the whole company would be better off if Desmond wasn't with us. I want to stay with my men. Colonel Cooney said that he felt that he had no reason for transferring him out of the company that it would have to come from someone else. I wanted to go further with it and have him transferred. And he gave me the, the go ahead to contact regiment, which I did. They said that they could not do it. They did not have the, the power to do it. And I proceeded to go to, to division. And uh, my understanding was that uh, they went to uh, General Randall who was assistant division commander, and he gave them the word that not only was he going to stay in the Army, but he was going to stay with me. Even after more than a year in the service, Desmond still found himself challenged by his commanding officers. October 19, 1943. Colonel Hamilton sent for me to talk to me, and he tried to shame me into taking a gun. He talked about Stonewall Jackson and Lee and a few other great warriors and told what great men they were, and they were great Christian men. He put it that I was letting others do my fighting for my religious rights. I told him there were other important jobs to be done other than having to take life, and I was willing to go to the front lines to save life, but not to take life. Colonel Hamilton's failure to convince Desmond to bear arms only heightened the Army's frustration and Desmond's officers grew openly less tolerant of his behavior. His refusal to carry a gun or work on Saturday was a regular source of irritation, and finally, they had had enough. So they convened a meeting to discharge Desmond on a Section 8 for mental instability. Desmond was called to answer a charge that he would be of no physical military use to the 1st Battalion because he was a conscientious objector. Sergeant Howe from the aid station came to my tent. Doss, turn in your aid kits. You are no longer in the medics. Man, you could knock me over fire. I couldn't believe it. But Cooney was pressured into at least holding this hearing or meeting whatever they would call it. And Cooney explained to him what was going on. If somebody had complained, people had complained, they didn't want him, and this and that, and this and that. I told them, for them to check the company records, he says, oh, we have no comeback on your work. You are just too strict on your religion. We want to just give you rest your Sabbath all. So why somebody did this, I don't know, unless they were in their mind, they're saying, well, I don't want to be in a foxhole with a guy that doesn't have a grenade or a gun or something, because he had done nothing that would cause them to initiate a charge of this type. I told him, sir, I cannot accept no Section 8 of my religion. To me, I feel I would be a very poor Christian to accept a Section 8 of my religion. You know, if somebody brought you up on something like that, you'd be inclined, the ordinary guy, I think, would be inclined to be nasty. Who said that? Why did they say that? So uh, he wasn't like that. I remember Desmond, and that's what struck me so much with him at that time. He said that he would be as good a soldier as you are, Colonel. He said, I'll be just as good as you. And. 
of course, history shows that he was not only good, but better. Finally, Colonel Cooney and his officers decided that Washington would never approve a Section 8 discharge purely on religious grounds. Desmond had prevailed for now. In October of 1943, the 77th Division moved to Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania. It was here that this man, Captain William T. Cunningham, took the controversy with Desmond's refusal to bear arms one step further. Goodbye. Jack Glover, Jim Boylan, and Ken LaFon remember the incident. Wake up alive in the morning, you made your day. When I met uh, Jim at the reunion in 90 in DC, because he told me that Cunningham died and we had a big drink over. <laughs> I was always wishing, to, I was always hoping to see him in a reunion. Was I going to give it to him after he, after he humiliated Doss right in front of me when we were waiting for a pass in Indian Town Gap? An order came down that week that everybody, everybody, including clerks, uh, truck drivers, cooks, and everybody had to uh, qualify with a rifle on the rifle range before they could get a pass to go into uh, town overnight. So I went over that night to uh, get my pass from the uh, CQ, to call it, charge of quarters. And uh, uh, Captain Cunningham was the one that was, had all the passes there. Desmond Doss just happened to be in front of me, right, right in front of me. So he got up there to get his pass. Cunningham looks over. You, you, you didn't uh, qualify with a rifle. You, you can't get a pass to go in town. He says, Captain, he said, I don't have to touch a rifle. He says, it's in my, on my record. I do not touch any weapons whatsoever. He says, you mean to tell me if you're in the house and a guy came in with a gun and your mother was sitting there, he, he, he said, I'm going to shoot your mother. And you had a gun nearby that you could have got and killed him. You mean to tell me you wouldn't have grabbed that gun and killed him? I said, I wouldn't have no gun. You have a gun. You mean you wouldn't use it? I said, I wouldn't have a gun. You mean you wouldn't do nothing? I said, I'm not, that's a horse of a different color. I didn't mean I wouldn't do anything. The only thing about it, when I got through with him, he probably wish he was dead. But as far as killing anybody, I don't want to kill nobody. What? What do you mean, he says? And he went into a tantrum about that. Man, he was strict at business. He had that carbine rifle. And he gave me a direct order. You take this gun, or you'll be caught, Marshal. I didn't take it. He grabbed it. Everybody was getting restless. You know, guys were standing on one leg and then the other and looking around, rolling their eyes and everything else, you know. Says, Doss, I don't want to have to court martial you. I'm going to give you one more chance. He held it up again, he dropped it. And I, and I didn't grab it, he grabbed it. Says, Doss, I am now court martialing you for refusing a direct order. Another officer in, the, in our company happened to come in, and he stood there for a second, and he saw what was going on. He says, it's right there on his record, Cunningham. He says, it's right there in black and white. He doesn't touch a rifle. He says, you don't have to he, give him his pass. He says, he don't have anything to do about touching a rifle. Well, I can't understand that, he says, but he lost that argument. But Cunningham was not finished with him yet. He placed Doss on permanent KP duty, scrubbing pots and pans until his hands were raw pieces of meat, and he would not give him any passes to visit his new wife. But Doss's greatest disappointment came when he got a letter from home. My brother that I hadn't seen for a year or two was going into the Navy. And if I wanted to see him, I better come home. Desmond was long overdue for a two-week furlough, so he went to Captain Cunningham to get his papers. They were all signed and ready. Cunningham was the only thing standing between Desmond and home. He looked at me. He says, Doss, you haven't qualified with your weapon. And he just throw that paper right in the hand. But there was nothing I could do. With his furlough papers torn up, Desmond's hopes of seeing his brother were gone. 
Of all the hardships and disappointments he had been through the last two years, this was the toughest. That's why I called home. I couldn't hardly talk on the telephone. I was so shook up and crying. Is that poor man, I, I couldn't have taken it. I couldn't have taken it if they'd have court-martialed me. I'd have told him to go to hell right there. I, I mean it. Heartbroken, Desmond had a hard time sleeping that night. All he wanted to be was a combat medic. But the next morning, to Desmond's surprise, he found Statman waiting to welcome him back into the medical corps. Desmond's father had made one call to the War Service Commission. His regimental commander, Colonel Stephen S. Hamilton, was reminded of the presidential order signed by President Roosevelt, affirming that conscientious objectors would not have to bear arms. Not even an army officer had the right to go contrary to this act of Congress. There weren't many, I don't think, that would have understood that he just had enough inculcation of his religion to say, I'm not going to do this. I don't know what it cost me, but I'm not going to have a grenade or a pistol or a rifle, even though, as was pointed out, other medics did. I knew if I ever once compromised, I was going to be in trouble. Because if you, if you can compromise once, you can compromise again. The standoff with Captain Cunningham marked the end of two years of fighting with the U.S. Army. Desmond's next battle would be with the Japanese Army. During the second week of March, 1944, the 77th, the Statue of Liberty Division, headed west to ship out. Desmond and Dorothy said their goodbyes. Well, the train pulled out, I said, I waved goodbye to her. And I tell you, it leaves you in a very low feeling knowing you may have seen your wife for the last time. I tell you, it's hard to keep from crying. Both of us trying not to cry which was because we want to be brave to encourage each other. But uh, the tears came over after the train pulled out. On the train, Desmond was doing his usual KP duty when he realized that they were going to pass his own backyard in Lynchburg, Virginia. He knew his dad loved to watch the trains go by, so he quickly scribbled a note. Dear mother and dad, I think we are coming by the home, so I will write you a few lines. I'm holding up good so far, and Lord answered our prayers, for I know I could not stand it giving up so much. Dot and I left each other with a smile as we wanted to see the smile last, and it didn't make it so hard on me. The handkerchief that waved Dot the last goodbye may wave to you the same. I hope to tie it around this and wave it as I go by. I'll need your prayers more than ever, but don't worry about me as I will be okay. Sure enough, Dad was watching the train pass by. Desmond quickly tied the note to a brick and tossed it for all he was worth yelling and waving and hoping to get his father's attention. But their eyes never met. As they crossed the old train trestle, Desmond watched his father disappear in the distance. I hit it all time low. I you know now I'd seen him alive once for the last time. And I just felt like I'd like just jump up to bag his car. I'm afraid I felt like I might never come back so why go. But I knew I had to get that stuff out of my mind. So I got busy with KP. After that, well, things were, well, I really weren't about as well as could expect. The island of Guam, Desmond and the men of the 77th Division get their first taste of war.
dig that hole, you get in it, and you stay there. You don't get out. The guy laying right beside of me, and the bullet come through right through his skull. If you had to go to the bathroom, you, you use your use your steel helmet and put it on the side of the hole till the next morning and wash it out the best you could and put it back on again. Laying in your foxhole that night and listening to the artillery coming in all night long, you hear the whistle, you know, and then the mortars, too, would drop in us. Your, your mind is, uh, it's like a haze because you're taking orders. You don't know why you're taking them. You just do because that's your job. That's your duty. Them boys fired them machine guns and things till the barrels was turning red. And it was scary, really scary. At night, that's when Desmond done a lot of his work, was at night. He'd go out and crawl around amongst our boys and see if they wasn't dead, he'd take care of them, willing to drag them back. And he wasn't supposed to do that? He wasn't supposed to move at night. He said, them guys that's wounded out there, I got to go see about them. That's my job. One time, there was a guy pinned down, and he he got to the guy. They were shooting at him, too. But I, I saw him get in there, but I never saw him coming out, you know. I don't know how he kept him getting shot by the enemy. Because some way he got to creep around on the ground and get by with it. The captain told me, he says, you know, there's a lot of people, you might, your own men might shoot you, you know. But he disregarded that, and he just went around. Anybody that needed help, he'd help him. Desmond talks about one particular soldier he would never forget. Blood had run down into the fellow's face and eyes. He was laying there just groaning and called for medic. I took water from my canteen, and he got some bandage, and I washed his face. And when I blood, was washed from his eyes, his eyes came up. Man, he just lit up. He says, I thought I was blind. And if I hadn't got anything more out the wall than that smile he gave me, I'd have been well repaid. The next morning, arriving at the bivouac area, Desmond discovered that the friend he had just saved had died. So from then on, I took care of the men, but I didn't want to know which one of my men I was taking care of because it's just too hard on me. Stories began to circulate about Desmond's willingness to help anyone who was wounded. They said that he had treated an enemy soldier while he was out there looking for ours, you know, creeping around out there. I don't know how bad the man was hit, but there was one found with a bandage on his arm, an American bandage. So that's the reason I figured he was right when they said he'd done it. But as dedicated as he was to saving all human life, Desmond and his fellow medics quickly learned that they would get no special treatment from the enemy. Medics were supposed to wear a so-called brassard or red cross on their arm and one painted on their helmet. Uh, our men quickly got rid of those things because it made them an outstanding target. I can remember sitting up on a ridge and watching these Medics trying to uh, evacuate a wounded uh, infantry person, and the Japanese were after. They were trying to kill the litter bearers. They preferred to get us above anyone else. They would let the infantry get by just to pick off a medic because they killed the medics. It broke down the morale of the men. The Japanese army took their demoralizing tactics to a level that the men never expected. An old man from one of the local villages told Desmond what the Japanese had done to the Okinawan people to instill abject fear of the Americans. They would call the village out for all the women to come. And then they would take the most beautiful woman 
and rape them in front of everybody. And so that's what the American dogs would do for you. Motivated by fear, the villagers learned how to kill. They had, they had a thing they called a bansai attack. They wanted to kill us while we were in our, in our foxholes at night. And they used these women with sharpened bamboo poles to kill us. And we were rolling these grenades down at the charging women. And we had to really kill them. Babies, for God's sake, women. We did it. I'm shaken. Hmm? The Japanese knew that breaking down the morale of the Americans would give them a tactical advantage. Jack Glover told me about when three Japanese soldiers approached, two on a bike and one running alongside. They were waving a white flag. And they got about 20 yards or so away from us, and, and uh, the two on the bike jumped off, and, and the one stopped, and all of them had grenades in their hands or nearby or in their pockets or whatever and they threw the grenades at us, and five of my men were wounded. After that time, my orders were to my men, when you see a white flag waved by a Japanese soldier, he will be dead, and there will never be another instance where anyone with a white flag gets that close to us and enabling them to wound us. Regardless of the Japanese brutality, Desmond's desire to treat anyone in need never changed. This Japanese was wounded. He needed medical help. I was going to get. I was going. I was going to take care of him. The fellows pulled the gun on me. They used some strong language. If you use any of that stuff on that blanket of black, we'll kill you. And I knew they meant it. So I knew better than try to take care of a Japanese. When it came to courage on the battlefield, the men of the 77th Division developed a hardcore reputation for never backing down. Even the infamous Japanese radio broadcaster Tokyo Rose called them the Butchers of Guam. But there was one man who was the exception to the rule the man who had tried to force Desmond to carry a gun. This guy Cunningham, who turned around and ran in the face of the enemy, turned around and ran, and everybody watched him. We were fighting the Japs, and I looked around, and Cunningham was running across the field, away from us, hightailing it across the field. And I actually drew a bead on him, and I was going to kill him. The truth of his behavior all the way through on maneuvers and every place else showed up when he turned around and ran in the face of the enemy. But Doss didn't do that. He didn't do that ever. And several stories came down as we gradually went along and after combat after combat, action after action, there was always some story in regard to Desmond Tidos, uh, the medic, that um, just absolutely refuses to allow wounded soldiers to, to not be treated, refusing to withdraw under any circumstance. When we went into Guam, that's when they started respecting him, because he'd, get, he'd go right on in there without no weapon, and any man that's willing to go into war without a weapon is uh, he's going to have to have faith. Okinawa, the hellhole of the Pacific. Okinawa to me was sleeping in rain, cold weather, with mud up to here, mud in your ears and your nose and your mouth in your shoes and other places. With Guam and Leyte behind them, 
Desmond and his men would face their greatest challenge as the 77th Division prepared to participate in an invasion bigger than D-Day. They would be thrown head first into the bloodiest battle in the Pacific Theater, codenamed Operation Iceberg. And we, we, could, we could see the fleet out in the water, all, the, all our ships, battleships and all, destroyers and flat tops, and we could see these kamikazes coming right in on them and hitting them. Boy, I'm telling you, that's a bad feeling. Ordered to replace the decimated 96th Division, the men of the 77th anxiously anticipated getting ashore, but no enemy waited to confront them. Instead, they had to face their own feelings of fear and foreboding. April 28th, 1945. Dear Dorothy, it won't be long before I won't be able to write you letters like this. Not that I don't love you as much, but because I have to keep my mind on my job so I can come back to you in good health and do my work the best I know how with God's help. When I see these uh, trucks coming out with the uh, dead people, uh, the dead American soldiers stacked on those trucks like cordwood, many trucks, not just one or two, but all of these dead comrades, friends, buddies coming back from where I'm going to, I, I had many misgivings about this. We went up to pick up bodies and, and stack them up alongside the road. So we'd, we'd pick them up, and of course, a lot of them were bloated and missing parts. And, and we had like one guy on one end of the litter, one guy on the other. And the guy would drop it because it was too heavy. And the guy said, oh, you're stupid, oh, so-and-so, you know. It, and it was, we were just oblivious of the fact that these used to be people. It, you know, we, it was like stacking up cordwood. You know, st we stack them up along the way and then put some more this way, and up as high as we could reach. You could, and so they could, uh, the trucks could come by and they'd put them on a truck, and take them back and I guess try to identify them. Yeah. It was just like it was, uh, I don't know, they just weren't people. <laughs> The mud was almost halfway up to our knees. And I was carrying this litter. I was carrying this litter. I, I, I was in the front of it. And I noticed a guy in front of me. He stepped in this mud puddle. And when he, when he, pulled, his, when he pulled his foot out, I, I, I could see the coagulated blood c coming, from his, coming from his shoe in, into the water, you know? And, and the water was all red. And I'm saying to myself, good God, I, I don't believe this. And so help me. There's about 200 yards there that, that we literally, literally w w walked through blood. That, it, it was that bad. It was that bad. I, I, I uh, dream about that sometime. I had mixed emotions about taking Desmond and his friends back to the escarpment. I didn't want them to have to think about what it was like. Yet on the other hand, I hoped it would help them remember. They had no trouble remembering. With my eyes open, I can visualize that escarpment and every damn piece on it with all the bad memories that I had about it. I want to go see it. Anxious to see it. I think maybe I can put a little more of it behind me. I couldn't sleep. I thought about it a little bit. I, what will my reaction be? Four twenty-eight to five nine. Can thank God that I am still alive. On the twenty-eighth, went up to relieve the ninety-sixth division, which had been unable to move for many days. They were held up at a ridge about three hundred feet high. It was called the escarpment. The morale of Desmond's men would be tested to the core as they faced this imposing monolith. 
Well, the Maida Escarpment uh, run almost across the island, the southern part of the island. It was a, a plateau that was uh, fortified uh, by reinforced pillboxes, caves, steel and concrete reinforced uh, emplacements. They had a, a view of the entire island from that point. It was a, a sheer wall of about at least 350 feet. They could not get past that. There was nothing that could get past that because it was so well defended. It was not hit and advance and hit and advance. It was a stagnant war. It was a uh, kill or be killed type of war on the spot right there. You didn't make much of an advance. The Japanese had been there for many years, and they had cut holes all in there. And this is where they had their uh, their headquarters, like where they had their food, their ammunition, their weapons, and uh, medication and stuff like that. They were down in there, and it could get out of the way when we drop our grenades in there and, and shoot in there. And one thing or other, they could get out of the way and just sit down and wait for us to, to leave. One time we had some Japs cornered in the cave, and we had an interpreter with us. He told them to come out with their hands up, you know. And he hit it with his flamethrower. I right shot it right inside the cave. And then we saw people coming out of the cave on fire with that, with that. And they were women. Not only, not only the Jap soldiers, the women that were with them. They were on fire, running out of the cave, rolling on the ground, suffering, screaming, howling. Wait, what the hell could you do, really, you know? That was pitiful. I don't like it. I, I, I may joke about it, but I, I, I'm very seriously, I don't, don't like being here. I don't want like it being brought back to my memory, bringing it back to me. Uh, I'd rather, I hadn't come, but as I said before, I felt I, I had to. Uh, it's so peaceful and quiet here. You, you can't imagine, you just can't imagine the difference. Just about this time of night, every night it started, because they'd let us occupy the top of the ridge most of the day, and just about at sundown, that's when they drive us off. Standing here, it is impossible for me to imagine the carnage, the killing field that existed on this plateau. Directly under this very spot, 400 Japanese soldiers lie entombed in their cave blown shut by Jack Glover and his men, just one of many. Nine times in seven days, the men were driven off the escarpment. The machine gun fire was so thick at times that men would be cut in half. Every night, there wasn't one inch of this parcel of rock that hadn't been bombed, mortared, or shelled. Eight company commanders were lost in less than 36 hours. Platoons with 30 men would come back with only five or six. The whole invasion became focused on the 77th vicious fight to take Hacksaw Ridge and hold it. We were sent up in groups of one, of two, of a squad, and we were thrown off. Then the next group came up. Then they were thrown off. And finally, we worked our way around from the east side, and we came across this little depression right here. We had stones built up that we picked up, and we built a rock to keep, keep the uh, machine guns from cross-firing, because they had a cross-fire across the top of this thing. Anybody popped his head up, he was dead. This is a Japanese position. And from here, the head 
a clear shot of all the modern movement. Not being able to get to the top, we called for coggernets. The uh, captain had called back to the colonel, and he said, what you want, Frank? He said, I want a cargo net. Same cargo nets that we climbed down from the uh, Army personnel carriers into the landing craft as we went ashore. Now, Frank, what in the hell do you want with a cargo net? He says, I'm getting, I'm going to go over that ridge. Someone had to go up and hang the cargo nets. Three men from B Company volunteered. Medic Desmond Doss was one of them. We got into these two by four, spliced them together, made a long ladder. And the sergeant and I climbed up and tied some cargo nets. I saw him up on this scarp, but he and this other man, and uh, they stood straight up on the scarp, but, and they silhouetted themselves up there, as you're not supposed to do. And at that time, the Japanese had been firing at us with uh, artillery and so on and so forth. But while he was up there, there was no Japanese fire that I saw or heard. That's kind of odd. Yeah, it is. This film shows the first rifleman climbing the wall of the escarpment. Desmond stands on top, having just secured the cargo nets. This was the last photo taken at the escarpment. The photographers refused to go any further. The fighting was too intense. Captain Vernon told some guy, one of the infantry men, to go up on the, and see what's going on up on top. Well, he climbed up the ladder, and as soon as he got up the top and got over the top, you'd hear, hear a machine gun fire, and then it was quiet. Didn't hear a thing. So then he sent another guy up, and he went up. Same thing happened. A third man was sent to the top, and the results were the same. Then Lee Willoughby and Desmond Doss were approached by a full bird colonel. When he came up past our platoon command post, I was reading my Bible, and he asked me how things are on top. I says, I don't know. The company command post is just below. You ought to check before you go up. But he came on up anyway. It was a matter of a few minutes, and, and uh, you could hear machine gun fire, or rifle fire. I can't remember. what it, You'd hear fire. And Desmond took a look over the top, and there he was lying prone. And Desmond went running up, and he told me to come up. And we got up next to him, and he had blood on his, on his front of him. I, you know, I don't know the extent of his wound to this day. He had blood on him, and Desmond said, uh, I don't have any plasma. Go down and get some plasma. So I had to go down. That whole slope down to where the aid station was was probably a couple hundred yards. And uh, there's mor mortar shells coming down all the time, and all these guys are all dug in. <laughs> and I'm running down, down there to get this plasma. I wasn't too happy about it. But when I got down there, I wish I could have stayed. But I got the plasma and, and ran back up again and, and uh, gave it to Desmond and he administered the plasma. Because of their great numbers, defensive tactics, and unfailing spirits, the Japanese seemed unconquerable. We called for the artillery fire to bomb them a while, and shoot them, and they would, and then we'd go back and try it again. And we'd, most every day, we'd, we'd maybe get to the top of it, but wouldn't stay long, we'd come by. And that happened several days in a row. Do you recognize these rocks in this area here? No trees, nothing, just rock, rock ground right there. Desmond told me how the Japanese would purposely let the Americans take this segment on top of the escarpment. Then when there was a high concentration of U.S. soldiers, the Japanese opened fire with everything they had, killing and wounding dozens of GIs and driving the rest back over the ridge, leaving behind the carnage. On April 30, 1945, Companies A and B were ordered to mount an assault on the escarpment. Preparing to go up with B Company, Desmond asked permission to pray for his men. Lieutenant Gornto granted his request. The attack was launched and A Company was decimated. B Company, the company Desmond prayed for, knocked out a large pillbox and returned without a scratch. Headquarters said that these, 
they sent a note down. You sure you got the right ridge? <laughs> because it was like a, like I say, it was like a miracle. Nobody got wounded or anything, killed or wounded. But on May 2nd, 1945, Desmond's request for prayer could not be granted. The assault was already in progress. The Japanese waited until B Company reached the top and then started a brutal barrage of artillery, mortar, grenade, and rifle fire. That's that, that, that boom, boom. It just The air was full of flak and uh, uh, grenade fragments and bullets. When you hear this, just like that, go by your head, you, you know that uh, that a bullet come pretty close to your head. We used to make jokes about it that, oh, don't, don't worry, don't worry about it. As long as you can still hear them, go by your head. You don't have to worry about it. Atop the escarpment, cries for a medic were heard. Ralph Baker found an unconscious soldier with head and chest wounds and both legs blown off. But how much time would it take to treat a guy with both legs blown off? After you put a, uh, maybe put a tourniquet on his legs. Right. And uh, uh, but if his legs were blown off, he would bleed, you know, terribly. So Baker was faced with a difficult decision. Try to save a man who would probably die anyway, or move on to help someone else. The guy was dying. And I just left him, walked on and left him. And he, uh, that's not callousness or nothing like that. There's one principle you almost use is uh, treat the least seriously wounded first. But Desmond Doss was guided by a different principle. I had taken care of men that was left for dead because they were unconscious. And so that's why I wanted to give this man the benefit of the doubt. My goal as long as there's life as always, hope. Desmond treated the wounded soldier and dragged him back to safety. The man survived and lived to be 72. That night, Desmond and a buddy were trying to get some sleep near the bottom of the escarpment when he heard Japanese voices coming from a hole just a few feet below him. Desmond grew concerned that they would be discovered. Between me and my buddy was these hand grenades. All I had to do is just pull the pin, and I knew I had some Japanese. This is a photo of the actual hole where the Japanese were setting up a machine gun. Just above, Desmond was facing the very crisis that his commanding officers had warned him about. When forced to choose between protecting his men or standing by his convictions, what would he do? And I thought of what I'd heard before. I shall not kill. God gave life, and I didn't want to take life. Desmond told me that this was the greatest temptation of his life. In the end, he decided that he could not kill, even at the risk of death to himself and his men. Meanwhile, nearby in another cave, Carl Bentley and his buddy, Charlie Edgett, faced their own moral dilemma. And we could see the Japanese feet going back and forth, just 10 feet, 20 feet from us and we were being real quiet. And there was one guy in there that was already wounded. And he was begging us to take his boots off. So I said, my feet hurt, please take my boots off. And uh, one, uh, one foot didn't have, he didn't have a foot. It was gone, it was blown off. The other foot was hanging by a tendon. And uh, we said, okay, we'll, we'll take your boots off. Just be quiet, quit moaning, because the Japanese will hear you. I haven't told this a lot of places. I don't know whether to tell it now or not. But we uh, we knew this guy couldn't make it. He was so wounded up, uh, wounded, shot up, just all through riddle, his body was all riddled, leaking out everywhere, blood leaking out of him. And we thought about going ahead and, and putting him out of his misery and putting us out of danger by killing him. We, uh, bayoneting him. And Charlie said, you do it, I can't. I said, no, I can't, Charlie, you, yeah, you'll have to do it. He says, I can't either. But it actually entered our minds, and shouldn't we go ahead and, and put an end to his life, and put an end to his moaning and groaning, and putting us in danger? We thought about it, but we couldn't do it. 
I'm ashamed that we thought about it. No, this ain't war, this is hell. Rifles broke right in two, canteens torn right in two and everything. It's just, that's how bad it was. Mortars coming down like grapes. I mean, cluster. People started shooting at each other. We were shooting our own men. And the Japanese came in on us, and they just came in in such hordes and such, so many of them, all so suddenly, that uh, they just knocked our boys down and out and and uh, killing them right and left, and uh, they just swarmed over us. Our guys were getting shot left and right. They were getting wounded, shrapnel, gunfire, grenades, mortars. An uh, American guy up on the ridge, he got bayoneted by a Jap. His stomach fell out. He was holding it, and he's, you know, he was so scared, he stopped backing up, and he went right over the cliff. And when he was yelling, going down, oh, I never forgot that. The routed Americans were called to a hasty retreat. Some were shot or bayoneted as they tried to climb back down the cargo nets. For the third time, we once again, we were kicked off of that escarpment. And, uh, and we left uh, many men up on top, injured men, wounded men up on top of the escarpment. One of the wounded was Private John Centola. The first time I got wounded, you know, you, you don't know what it's all about till you get whacked. Desmond Doss, you know, he was working on me, and he says, take it easy, you'll be all right. He says, uh, and I couldn't believe how calm he was. And uh, while he was working on me, I asked him, I says, uh, you don't have any weapons. I says, I'll give you a forty-five. He says... No, he says, I can't kill anybody, you know. He says, that's my religion. And I says to myself, he's a warrior, you know. Centola watched as Desmond disappeared into the mayhem. Out of 155 of Company B, 55 retreated under their own power. The rest remained on top. The next thing I knew, uh, to my recollection, was that there was a man up on top aiding injured men and bringing them back to the ledge. And they says, yeah, there's some, some nut up there that's getting, getting his butt shot off, saving <laughs> the infantrymen. That nut was about to become their most loved medic. What Private Desmond T. Doss did over the next 12 hours was nothing short of a miracle. Every time I'd look, he was, he was there. <laughs> He's letting these our wounded down to the, the other people down below, the medics and one thing, the other, taking them home down back below where they could be taken away. He kept on dragging people back to the ledge and, and uh, getting those people to the ledge so that he could uh, lower those people to the bottom where they could be treated properly. And he was covered from head to foot and in blood, and uh, he, he was just a mess. I, I happened to be in a position there where Dulce was uh, near me. And someone told Doss that there was a man out there that uh, was wounded and needed help. And he went out there and got him. Period. And the mortar fire and the rifle fire was just heavy, real heavy. And uh, I was down in my foxhole and, and shooting and peeping over the edge and everything. But Doss got up and walked out there and got him and brought him back. The bullets are flying and shells going off. You have to make yourself as small a target as possible. And so in order to get the men over here, I just caught them by the collar of the neck, and I got down close to the ground and dragged for all I was worth. Then I felt like the Lord impressed on my mind. That bull on not you tied in West Virginia. Hey, that double loop. You know, I took that rope and I had a double loop. Then I put the leg through each loop. Using that double loop bowling knot he discovered back in training, 
Desmond quickly secured each man and lowered him over the 70-foot cliff. They were hollering at him. Hey, Doss, get down from there. You can't, you can't stay up there. Get down. And he just, like he didn't hear them. Like they weren't there. One time, he had one man on each arm. They were partially equipped, where they could partially help themselves. And he was leading this one man under each arm, on with you, each arm, and bringing them over there to let them down. I thought, this is amazing. How can this guy do this? He, he, that's in way over 150 pounds, I don't think, you know, maybe a little more when he's in the service, but not a very big man. So it was just amazing. The wounded men lay scattered across the rocky plateau, some as far away as 125 yards from the cargo net. Desmond dragged or carried each man back to the edge of the escarpment by himself. Time after time, I saw dogs go back into, into the enemy, into the Japanese, and pick up wounded, uh, wounded, and bring them there and let them down on these ropes and one thing or another off of the escarpment. And the bullets were flying like, like bees or something. It was just, it was miraculous. I, I couldn't understand how he could do this. I was praying the whole time. I just kept praying, Lord, please help me get one more. When I got this, I said, Lord, please help me get one more. It was just as if God had his hand on his shoulder. It was the only thing, I, the only explanation I can give. Desmond worked alone as the battle raged on around him, ignoring the constant danger. Knowing that the Japanese would torture a wounded soldier at night, Desmond refused to leave a single man on top. They, they were coming down every so often, and uh, some of them were dead, and some of them were wounded. You, you know, sometimes you didn't know which was which, and some were crying, and, and uh, but we'd, we'd try to reassure them We'd say, hey, you're OK. You know, you're, you'll be OK. Maybe they weren't, but uh, at least give them a little assurance that uh, they were, uh, they had a chance. From this vantage point, the Japanese had a clear shot at Desmond as he lowered the men to safety. One Japanese soldier reported that he had had Desmond in his sights, but his gun jammed every time he pulled the trigger. In spite of all their attempts to kill him, Desmond was never hit. During this chaotic 12-hour period, Desmond let down 75 men, averaging one man every 10 minutes. Some of them were even still in the litter while he lowered them down. They were, they were, they were tied onto the litter, and they, he, he lowered the heat to himself. I mean, he could have been pulled over so easily himself, and if he got fell down, he would have been killed. I was fighting for freedom by trying to save life instead of taking life because I couldn't picture Christ out there with a gun killing people. I like to think of, of him out there with a kid like me. He was an exceptional man. To have the, to have the guts, as we call it, to just go back up there all the time and go out and bring those guys in when they were hit. Somebody can tell you something, you know, but when you actually see what this guy did uh, under con combat conditions, you know this guy's, a, he's all right. The only way you can look at it, just see what he did. After another four days of savage fighting, the escarpment was still in the hands of the Japanese. Operation Iceberg had been held up long enough and the other divisions needed to continue their assault. So invasion headquarters passed down an order that Hacksaw Ridge must be taken, no matter what the cost. Colonel Hamilton's battle-worn 307th Regiment would make one final all-out attack the next morning, May 5th, 1945. By now, the weary men of B Company had come to implicitly trust Desmond. He was their security blanket and they felt safe knowing that Desmond would take care of them no matter what. But May 5 fell on a Saturday, Desmond's day of rest. So Captain Vernon asked me about going, because you know the only medic we have left, would you mind? I told him I'd like to finish my private devotion first. 
Captain Vernon had his orders from the headquarters, but he said, yeah, I'll do it. Hidden in a niche on top of the escarpment waiting to attack, Jack Glover wondered why there was a delay. And I uh, heard from Captain Vernon, the captain of B Company, that uh, he had to delay it uh, for some time because Doss wanted time to read his Bible. And he wanted that time granted. Captain Vernon knew that his request to delay the assault would affect the entire division. But he sent it up the chain of command anyway. The time actually was uh, granted by Colonel Hamilton, the commander of the regiment. The same Colonel Hamilton who tried to shame Desmond into carrying a gun back at Camp Hyder now put the entire division on hold while Desmond read his Bible. Des went off to the side and prayed and said, OK, I can go now. It more or less said, uh, I've got permission from God. I can go. <laughs> As the only medic working with B Company, Desmond had his hands full again. In the midst of the fierce fighting, he not only took care of his soldiers, he also treated many of the men in Company A. That day, the 307th Regiment held the escarpment, AKA Hacksaw Ridge, for good. The sun went down and Desmond's Sabbath ended. Being in a medical corps, it was a type of work I could do seven days a week. And so it didn't make it enough. It was Sabbath or not. It was doing good. If he had been uh, without the belief and without the religious commitment, I think he would have been much less of a person doing his duty as he did it with his commitment. He'd be like the rest of us. <laughs> now that the escarpment had been secured, the invasion could advance. The number of dead and wounded continued to swell on both sides. Near the base of the escarpment, a Japanese artillery shell nearly killed Jack Glover. Coming to his aid was the man he had tried so hard to kick out of the army. Right down there in some spot in that parking lot, I was wounded when the shell hit. And that's when you came over and treated my wounds. My thought changed about how wrong I was and say, or trying to have him kicked out because here he was doing a service and my mindset was in regard to physically fighting a war, and his mindset was in treating wounded and, and having nothing to do with the war. See? On a moonless night, May 21st, 1945, Company B was on a covert mission just a half mile past the escarpment when Desmond himself came close to being killed. They inadvertently had walked into a company of Japanese soldiers. It was hand-to-hand -hand combat, and in the chaos, Desmond crawled from soldier to soldier, treating the wounded. And they began to throw these hand grenades. I saw it coming. There's three other men in the hole with me. They were on the lower side. But I was on the upper side looking when it was through the thing. I knew there was no way I could get out. So I just quickly take my left foot and throw it back to where I thought the grenade might be and throw my head and the helmet to the ground. And no more than happened before, brother. I felt like I was sailing through the air. I was seeing stars I wasn't supposed to be seeing. And I knew my legs and buttocks were blown up. Desmond waited five long hours before Ralph Baker reached him. As Baker and the other litter bearers carried Desmond through an intense machine gun battle, Desmond saw a soldier lying unconscious, a bullet wound to his head. You know, Terry, Desmond was wounded, and while he was laying in his litter wounded, some guy got hit, and he rolled up his litter to go over and patch the guy up. Now, who the hell would do something like that? After giving up his litter, Desmond was hit again, this time by a sniper's bullet, shattering his arm. Using what little strength he had left, Desmond made a splint out of a rifle stock and crawled the remaining 300 yards under fire until he reached the safety of the aid station. 
Eventually, Desmond was taken to the hospital ship Mercy. It was here that he realized something had been left behind. May 31st, 1945. Baby, did I tell you of my misfortune of losing my little Bible when I was hit? I sure hate that, but I'm in hopes that someone has found it and is holding it for me. I'm planning on writing Company B and see if anyone has it. I sure hope so. That was my main source of strength all during the war and in the service. And then when I lost, I was lost. When the men of Company B found out that Desmond's Bible lay somewhere on the battlefield, they acted without hesitation. Retracing Desmond's steps back into the combat zone, they searched the rough terrain for Desmond's Bible and kept searching until they found it. It really gives you a mixed feeling. The way you feel like crying, you can't keep from crying. You feel so happy to think that they will even risk their life under those conditions. I didn't know just how bad the situation was at the time. It wasn't until later I found out what they went through to find it for me. The war in Okinawa claimed the lives of 115,000 Japanese soldiers. It killed one-third of the Okinawan population, over 100,000 people. And 15,000 American soldiers gave their lives on this piece of coral rock. But on May 23, 1945, with a fractured arm and 17 pieces of shrapnel embedded in his body, Desmond Doss headed home. There's not too many people that would uh, put their life on the line like he did. A lot of those fellows that he saved were ones that rebuked him during training. Then he turns around and saves their life. Uh, it takes quite a, man, quite a man to do that. They call them a nut. What a beautiful nut, huh? Oh, gee. You know, what Desmond did, you, you, I could talk to you for a year and a half. You'll never believe what he did. I wouldn't take back the time that I've known him for nothing. He, he deserves more than a bronze star or a silver star. I'm saying, let's put him in for the Medal of Honor. Fifteen heroes decorated by President Truman with a Congressional Medal of Honor. Then the conscientious objector hero, Corporal Desmond Doss, refused to fight, refused to kill. A medical corpsman, he displayed self-sacrificing valor in the care of the wounded. Now he receives the nation's highest military decoration and explains his view as a conscientious objective. I thank God for letting me do my part in this war and saving the lives of my fellow men. The reason why I do not bear arms... He came up, I saluted him. He reached out and called me by my hand. He began to shake like an old-time friend. I, I thought I was going to be nervous. He didn't give me a chance to get nervous. And then he was telling me, you really deserve this. He said, I consider this a greater honor than being be the president of the United States. Desmond, how do you feel about receiving the Medal of Honor? I feel very highly honored because I like to feel like I am wearing it and honored all the men that paid the supreme price for that country. And I thank God he enabled me to do what I did to save life. Desmond's life has been far from easy since the war. His wounds left him 100% disabled, including losing one lung due to tuberculosis contracted in Okinawa. 
The Army's efforts to treat his TB ended when they gave him an overdose of antibiotics that left him totally deaf. My equipment like myself. Old and worn out. Seems it's trying to break down fast and I ain't fixing. In November of 1991, Desmond's wife Dorothy died from brain cancer. He later married Frances, who's been by his side for over a decade. Together, they've created a home that, for me, was like going to Grandpa and Grandma's house, a place that you want to get there fast and leave slow. He still follows the principles he learned as a child. It has sustained him through a lifetime of challenges. For nearly 50 years, Desmond has attended the same little country church. If you're going to walk the walk, folks, you have to talk the talk. That's exactly what it's like. Sabbaths are still the highlight of his week. The accolades bestowed on Desmond from the war have not changed him. Today, he is still that same little boy who walked six miles to give blood to a complete stranger and then turned around and did it again a few days later. He is a man at peace with his life, with his faith, and with his memories. But what became clear to me was that his whole being was so profound that it changed the world around him. I know, because Desmond changed me. Even though I said those things to him in regard to carrying a rifle, and, and he would never be my by my damn side at all unless, unless he had a rifle type thing. Well, I was immature in uh, what I was saying because I wasn't uh, I didn't know him as the man. Uh, I knew him only as a, a skinny little kid in front of me that that I felt uh, couldn't carry the load. But then uh, in the long run, finding out that not only, well, he was a skinny little kid, but uh, not only was he that, but he was one of the bravest persons alive. And then to have him end up saving my life was the irony of the whole thing. From the beginning of his first combat mission until the last one, he absolutely was fearless in regard to what was going to happen to him. You can go back over Medal of Honor winners, and it's because of one absolute instant of decision. And Dawson's was a constant doing of something that uh, was so outstanding, not only once, but time and time and time and time and every time again. He did the right thing about in carrying out his obligations. Not only his obligations to God, but his obligations to his fellow human beings, and particularly to his fellow, fellow uh, Americans. There is a mystique about him because he's a, kind of a loner. He's here and he's all by himself at different times. But that is Desmond. It's enhanced by his deep faith and his care for his fellow man, courage and bravery and humility. He's got it. Could run through the alphabet with uh, descriptive adjectives and go from A to Z or from Alpha to Omega in the Greek, and you'd find some word that vividly describes the basic Desmond Doss. I'm proud to have known him.